Previously, we have written code that is executed in a sequential manner. So the statements are just executed one after the other on a line by line basis. So here there's just a path from the beginning to the end of the code. So for example, this will be the start of our main function. So we might, you know, the statements just get executed like line by line until we get to the end of the main function. So there's just this single path from beginning to end. But often we need to make a decision during the code and the code may branch off onto a different path depending on the outcome of the decision. So the column, it's a bit like a tree. So this is our, say, this will be like our main tree trunk. Then, you know, as the code's executed, it might, it might branch off. It could branch off at a different place and each of these branches could also branch off. So you can see you start getting this kind of tree type um, shape and so on. So this decisions that are made when the code is executed are almost always logical expressions. So the results of a logical expression it evaluates to a true or a false. So the data type could be true or false is known as a boolean. So as well as ints, chars, floats, there's also a boolean type. So C, the language C did not originally contain a boolean data type. So instead, integers were often used to represent this, and this, well, there still are a lot of cases. So, it, you know, an integer of value zero would equate to false, and one would be true. But in fact, any non zero value would be interpreted as true. So, um, so zero is false, and anything else is true. So, two is true, minus one is true, 6.582 is true. So anything non-zero is true, just zero is false. But in C++, there is actually a bool data type. So you can actually create a variable. So here I've called it val for value. So you can create, a, there is a data type called bool. You can explicitly say it's true or false. So just be aware if you do see this crop up in code. So the first type of branch we're going to look at is an if statement. This is a bit, one of the most common and basic branching statements. So if the result of the conditional statement evaluates a true, then one particular block of code is executed. And if the result is false, then the block of code is skipped. So it's very useful to draw right these branches using flowcharts. So we're going to begin here and when the code will be executing, we'll get to some conditional statement. If that statement is true, then we'll carry on, we'll execute some other code. But if it's not true, we'll just skip that code entirely. So you can see there's two possible branches through this code. We could either go here, and this code will be executed. Or if that's false, we'll miss that code. So you can see this is a simple branch. So we'll look at the implementation here. So we've got, we've created a variable A, let's give it value of six, so we can say if A is greater than zero, we print a message, A is positive. And then we do another, so you can see, this is our logical statement, we use this if syntax here. So we put our conditional statements in brackets, so it's very important to put these two brackets in. You know, you need to have the brackets, and then open and curly, so these define, you know, that's kind of what I imagine that's like the first curly brace and this is the second curly brace. Because you could have multiple lines of code here, you don't just have to, have to have one. So it's whatever code is included between these two braces is what executed. And we've got a second variable, so b, so int b is minus five. So we're going to say if b is greater than zero, we print b is positive. So again, we have this if syntax, brackets, contain contain our logical expression and then we'll have a printf at the end for end. If you compile and run this you'll probably be able to guess that this is what you'll see on the terminal. So you can see there's got the value it's been assigned the value 6 so this is obviously true so this code will be executed and hence the message appears here. So but then the next bit, B has got the value minus 5. So if 
minus 5 is greater than 0. That's obviously false, so this isn't printed. And instead, so that is skipped, and we'll just jump to the end, and that will print. So it's very easy, very simple. Just make sure you get the syntax correct. So it's this uh, that type of syntax you want to be looking at. So we can extend this to an if-else statement, what we call. So you can see this is our kind of very similar to our um, if statement. But now, if the result is false, we'll execute a different if statement instead. So again, we've got our, we've still got two branches. So this branch will execute this statement. Now we've got a separate branch where it executes this one. So this is like an either-or situation. If it's true, we'll execute this. If it's false, we'll execute this. So now we can extend the previous example to add on different to add on this else block. So we've got this this bit is exactly the same as before, but now we're just adding on this else. So look at this syntax here. So we've just got else open curly bracket close curly bracket. We've got a statement. So we've got two options here, depending on whether this is true. So this if this is true, we'll do this. If it's false, we'll do this. The same with the bottom one. We just extended that to add on this else statement here. So if you can compile and run, no surprising, this is what will appear. So the top one, again, this was true. So, um, so this is a message that will appear. When we get to the second part, that's false. So that won't be printed, but this will be printed. So again, it's the determined by the curly braces. That defines a block of code what will get executed depending on that conditional statement. And we can also have an if else if statement, and this is where we're just this is basically just building upon these previous ones. So we can have multiple conditional statements that, that are evaluated in turn. And as soon as we come to one of the statements that's true, that's um, that you know the code associated with that is executed, and then it jumps to the end of this uh, if else if statement. So with this situation, only one of the code blocks can be executed. So this is different if you've got I mean, if you've got multiple if statements, one after the other, with an if, else if, else if, else if, um, only one of them can be executed. So this is the kind of flow chart it will look like. This could obviously be ex extended just to as many as you wanted. You could just keep doing the same kind of pattern. So you start off, you check the first statement, is this true? If it is true, you execute that statement and you get to the end. If it's not true, then you check this one. If it's true, if it if it's not true, you go to the next one and so on. So only one of them can be true. So if the first one is true, that's the only one that will be checked. These will not even be checked. But if it's false, we go through, we just keep going through until we find a true one. If this one's true, we go through. That one's true. We could just chain as many as these together as we want to. If you get to the end of this block, and none of them's true, we'll just go and nothing will happen. So this is an example here. For a degree classification, we've got a variable with a grade in it. So if grade is greater than 70, we're going to print it's a first class. Else if the grade 6 is a naught, now this syntax, now we're using the syntax. Else if, and we get, we've got a different conditional statement here. So if it's greater than 60, we print 2, 1, greater than, else if greater than 50, 2, 2, greater than 40 is a third, else if grade is greater than 0, it's a third. So these are the different thresholds. So if you print that, you can see it started off, this wasn't true, so grade, that, that was false, so that wasn't done, so it checked the next one in turn, grade is greater than 60. So you can see that is true, so it's printed that message, and then it's jumped to the end. So that's very important because you can see um, 67 is obviously, that's true, that's true, that's true, that's true. But it's not printed 2, 1, 2, 2, third, fail. As soon as it gets 1, that's true, and it jumps to the end. So when you're doing this type of thing, it's, up, it's important to get the ordering correct. Because you will not want to do, if you started here, grade is... Uh, zero and then we put say 40 there 50 60 70 you 
can see, even if you got even this value was a two, for example, um, it will print class one. So you need to be careful of your ordering when you do that. But we notice on the on this if else if block, there was if none of the conditional statements were true, there's no guarantee that any code will be executed. So like this, for example. They're all false, so we'll just jump to the end. But we can kind of combine this with an if else statement to have this kind of have this final else part, which is a catch all. So now we just add that on, so we, it doesn't matter, even if none of these statements are true, so we guarantee that some code will be executed. So this is just this kind of catch all statement we add at the end. So we can actually rewrite that previous one. So rather than having an else if at the end, we can just swap that for an else because we don't really need to check. If we go back to that previous example, else if grade is greater than zero, we don't really need to do another check there. We can just say uh, if it's not a first, if it's not a two one, if it's not a two two, if it's not a third. It must be a fail. So just if you um, compiled and ran that code, all these would be false. That's false. It won't run. False. 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 So it'll just fall back and execute this. Give us a fail and print end. So if you know in the previous examples how the code was nicely formatted and structured. So the particular thing to watch out for is the tabs. You know, you've got to make use of tabs when you're writing code. And often the IDEs and text editors used for coding will automatically do this for you. So it makes it easy to see which code belongs inside of a function. And then, um, the uh, you know, which blocks are inside of the conditional statements. So it's, it makes it easy to read. So I look back at this example. So inside of main, all these are tabbed in so you can just very quickly see because they're tabbed in we know they're all part of the main function and then inside each one of these these are all tabbed in so we know that they're inside of these if else if statements then we've also used blank lines to separate the code into sections so you, you know you don't really need a new line here you don't need a, that blank line but it's just nicely saying, right, this is the kind of setting our um, setting our input value, say, then we've left a blank space and we've got, right, now we've got this structure here where we're making some decision and we've left a gap, left a blank line here and we're going to get our final output. So if you use blank spaces just to kind of uh, separate the code into sections, it makes it much easier to read because it, um, it is true code that looks like rubbish tends to work like rubbish and if you look at code and it's all horribly formatted horribly structured it's no surprise when you compile it and it doesn't compile you can normally tell just by looking whether it's going to compile or not but it's nicely structured nicely formatted it's much easier to spot errors and it's easier to find and fix